you know, you start fishing those edge seams, that's where you're going to find fish. I'm going to stop you right there and say this, Hagen, if you're listening out there, all the stuff that he just talked about, we experienced. been traveling to Kentucky this past year just for quick getaways uh and we fished the Cumberland several times last year we caught rainbows and browns and brook trout and when we went we fished streamers nymphs and dries and caught fish on all of them believe it or not the first fish on the dry were the first one I think was a brook trout actually so that kind of made sense but it was on really high water which was surprising we were just fishing banks and wood but uh, I noticed the river seems to have a large number of fish. And my grandfather told me one time, he said, I, I went to the clinch and fished and I was only had like a 60 fish day, you know, just an awesome day. And I was telling him about it. And he said, what'd you catch them on? So I told him, you know, I don't remember what it was we were fishing, but I told him and he just said, is that all you fished? And I said, yeah, you know, that's a lot of fish. He said, when the fish are biting, it's a time to experiment. And going back and catching the, the fish on streamers and the fish on nymphs and the fish on dries, it seems like that the Cumberland is a good river to experiment on. How is it for trying different types of flies? Oh, uh, yeah, it's it's great for that, David. It really is. I mean, you can, you can almost just kind of think up any old Frankenstein you want to put together, <laughs> you know, and, and fish it and it was liable to work. You know, I mean, it's the kind of river. It's an interesting tailwater, you know, it, it has a little bit of southeastern kind of character to it, and it has a little bit of midwestern kind of character to it. And so it seems like you can take, you know, any number of this these flies from these different areas and bring them to the Cumberland and they're probably going to work, you know, whether it's, a, you know, a, a red ass wet fly from the White River or some kind of typical pheasant tail that you're used to fishing in a in a Tennessee tailwater, you know, all that kind of stuff is going to work on the Cumberland. And it seems like, you know, just kind of everything in between. So, you know, it's a great river, you know, uh, particularly for people that tie their own flies and like to kind of mess around doing that. Uh, this is a great place to, you know, just like I said, put together one of those kind of Frankensteins and take the river and see what happens. I mean, you know, the Cumberland's the kind of river, you know, you can catch fish on, you know, everything from a mop fly to an egg pattern to a Chernobyl ant to a beadhead nymph for a woolly bugger, you know, so sometimes all of those will work in the same day. So, it, you know, it is a great river to kind of experiment with and just kind of try out new stuff. You know, that's one of the things I really like about it, you know. When I came up there, I I didn't go to experiment. I got to get, I, I went up there to get away. That was my whole, that's been my whole MO to go up there and right fish with friends and that sort of thing but i did notice that there were times that you just would we tried different things and they all seemed to work some better than others yeah so i can see where someone who who might want to experiment with their own flies might like to tie their flies the reason why i came back around to the you know it seems like there's a, a large number of fish up there uh is because whenever i was able to look in the water you know you could see okay there's there's more fish there than some of the other rivers but I kind of went back to, oh, you know what? Yeah, we could we could bring some flies up here and try them. And you get enough shots at fish to where you could actually find out, okay, this works better than this. Later in, later in the year, you don't have those long dry spells where you're wondering, is it my nymph or is there just not a lot? Are there not a lot of fish here or, you know, what's the problem? So it yeah. kind of helped me understand that, you know, some flies work better than others, but I had shots with everything we tried. Yeah. Even the dries on, on high, high water was, was interesting. We had dries on low water, caught fish, had dries on real, real high, high water fish in the banks in the wood and still had fish. So I know they all pretty much get pushed to the banks and, and I want to touch on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, but so are there cutthroat up there as well now? Well, they stopped cutthroat this year. Uh, the, this was uh -huh. like the first, well, not the first stocking. They did one in 2019, but it was during that real bad flood spring that we had. And they ended up putting oh, yeah. 
they essentially dumped a lot of those fish down there in Burks in the Burksville area and nobody ever heard from them again. And mm. so, so they, last year they had trouble at the hatchery where a lot of the cutthroat eggs didn't make it. And so this was the first year that they did, you know, kind of a big posted cutthroat stocking. And I don't exactly remember when that was. I think it was uh, late August or maybe September. I, you know, they stocked those fish where I fish a lot. And I have literally caught probably a thousand fish, at least hundreds of fish since they stocked those cutthroats. And I've yeah. not seen any. So, you know, that kind of that sort of indicates to me that they probably did not make it. You know, I, I'd say they were probably striper bait. If I had to guess, I, I'd, re, I'd really like to see cut get established in the river. You know, they're a lot of fun to fish for. They're dry fly eaters yes. and, uh, <laughs> you know, they're beautiful, beautiful fish and, you know, aggressive and all that. But, um, you know, I, I just don't know if, you know, the common's going to sustain them or not. Unfortunately, we'll see. Hopefully that, hopefully they try it again. I've talked to a lot of people fished on the river and just not coming across them. So, and, and they're not seeing them in the shocking surveys that the Fish and Wildlife is doing. So it's kind of indicative of probably not making it. Exactly what it sounds like. From high atop the world headquarters of Southeastern Fly, this is the Southeastern Fly podcast. Thanks for joining us on this episode. Feel free to share this episode with friends and your fishing partners. Subscribe or follow so you'll be the first to know when an episode drops. If you find value in the podcast, please drop by the Southeastern Fly store. Explore that merch that fuels this podcast. Also, if you need additional information about fly fishing techniques, flies, fly tying gear, remember, we've got the fly fishing coaching sessions that are open now, and we've got a few time slots available. Not a, not a ton of those left, but we've got a few of them. These sessions are best for new and intermediate medium anglers. Coaching has already helped students become more skilled fly anglers, and our students are already producing better results for themselves. So that's pretty cool. So who's our guest today? He's got 20 years guiding experience on the Cumberland River. He grew up in Lexington, Kentucky, and currently resides in Somerset. He guides from a Stu Williams wooden drift boat. He introduced drift boats to the Cumberland River. He can be found at www.cumberlandtroutfitters.net. That's like a fishing net. He's the owner of Trump Cumberland Trout Fitters. His name is Hagen Wan. Hagen, welcome to Southeastern Fly. Thank you, David. Thanks for coming out and agreeing to answer our questions. Hagen and I talked the other day about several things. Uh, we talked a lot of fishing, and then we talked about this podcast a little bit too. But he's got some good information on the on the Cumberland, and and I've been up there. Like I said, I've been up there some over the past year and caught fish and had a really nice time. And I like the area. I really like the area. It's not easy to get to. That's the one no. thing that I found. You really can't get there from here, no matter where here is. But uh, eventually you, you end up somewhere. We stayed at the campground uh, a couple times right below the dam. And that was nice. I'll tell you what I did see. And we didn't talk about this, but I'll, I'll tell you this. We stayed at the campground. And what I noticed is there's a lot of families staying up there. A lot of nice folks. Mm -hmm. clean restrooms which is an absolute must for david mm -hmm. everybody kind of wound out about nine o'clock at night so it's just a really nice quiet time and i think that was another one of the things that i i think i really like that not a lot of hooping and hollering and all that stuff so they get up early in the campground yeah well we were up at four and we were on the river at five so we were we were one of the first ones out and then we were we were off the river we were off the river by 12 30 ish and then whatever that little town is over there, I can't remember what the name of the town is. It's got a little square and there's an old timey diner there. Um, Jamestown. On the square. Jamestown. Jamestown yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a cool little guitar shop there too. I don't know if you've ever mm -hmm. been in there, but it's a really cool guitar shop that's in there right on about two doors down from the diner. But after getting up that early, not probably eating uh, a ton the night before, then fishing all day. And maybe, I think maybe I had a Snickers for breakfast. Yeah. By the time I got to that diner, that hamburger was so dang good. Goodness, <laughs> it was good. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, we were able to fish there and the fishing was good. I, I have to say it was good. And for the first few times on the river, I, I felt like we did pretty good. Uh, just some friends 
basically getting out to fish. But I know several years ago, they did some repairs to the dam and they lowered Lake Cumberland. That's very similar to what happened to Center Hill, right? The Center Hill may have been a year or two behind, mm-hmm. but I noticed that that the Caney really suffered through those years. It's starting to turn and make a comeback and all that, but the water was certainly warmer. Uh, sometimes it, it, even in June, it was starting to get warm and you could, you could tell the fishing start dropping off and then it was done. Mm-hmm. So the fishing slowed. So can you talk about how the fishing was before the, before they, started lowering the lake during the time that they started lowering the lake or they lowered the lake to do the repairs. And then now after, can you talk about that for us? You know, I, I started fishing the river, you know, probably in the late eighties, early nineties. And, you know, so I can speak from, you know, then on back then we, we had a lot more Brown trout, you know, and the river was sort of known as a, as a Brown trout fishery, had a lot of big trophy class sort of Browns. The rivers had it's long had a, a regulation on it, like a special trophy regulation for Browns, where you can you know only keep one fish per day. You know, for those who who are not catching and releasing, they can only keep one brown trout per day, and it has to be at least twenty inches long. So they've always had these regulations that sort of encouraged larger Browns in the river, and that was real successful back in the day. It seemed like had really good populations of insects. And, you know, the, the Cumberland's, a little, it's a little bit unique tailwater. Maybe maybe the other tailwater's like this, I'm not sure, but a unique river in some regards because, you know, we don't have a whole lot of bait fish and crawfish and some of those invertebrates that people, you know, typically think of large brown trout as switching their diets over to, you know, at some point off of insects. Right. And so I think that the brown trout in the Cumberland are a lot more sensitive to insect populations than they are in maybe some other rivers. I'm no ichthyologist and I'm sort of making a lot of this up, David, to be honest with you, but this, I think I've got a theory <laughs> here. And, um, you know, I think that during the, that drawdown process, you know, we lost a lot of our grass beds and, you know, the insect populations kind of suffered from the water quality change. And I think that, uh, you know, that the brown trout populations sort of declined because of that and never really have come back. And part of that is because mm-hmm. the insect populations haven't fully come back. I think they will eventually, you know, like they did on on the Caney. It's just a lot bigger river system. You know, it's, it's probably going to take longer for some of those wounds to heal. You know, one positive thing about it is it, it, the rainbow trout fishing is probably the best that I've ever seen. It. They have uh, benefited from the special regulations that they put in. It's been a number of years ago now, probably 10 years or more. They put in special regulations where you have to release all rainbows between 15 and 20 inches. It's basically a a release slot, and they're encouraging those larger uh, size class fish, and they do limit the take on rainbows over 20 inches to one per day. And a total of five fish for the day, I think, is the creel limit on rainbows which is lower than it used to be. It, it used to be eight whenever I first started fishing on the river. The combination of those regulations being in place for a while and the freeing up of that sort of space that was left occupied by those brown trout, I think has really benefited the rainbows. And, you know, the rainbow trout fishery now on the combo is just incredible. I mean, it's a great tailwater rainbow fishery. That theory, all of that can make some sense if you sit and think about it. Here's something that I've read or heard or somebody told me that it takes de- maybe decade, two decades, whatever, for a tailwater to mature. Yeah. And when you put a, a, a whole three years or how, how long did they do? It the was seven, seven years. Okay. Time flies. Yeah. They started work in 2007 and they completed it in 2014. So you've got a seven year break of, of it not being as consistent probably as what it air quotes again, kind of what it has been over the past however long. Then you put a break in there to where they lower the lake, change the water a little bit up there on top. And then the next thing you know, yeah. it's it's changing it a little bit. And then it, then they get what it sounds like is back on some sort of normal schedule, yeah. maybe. They lowered the lake 40 feet. You know, they took it from 722 foot elevation to 682, and they left it there for seven years. 
And so there obviously wasn't as much cold water available in the river system, you know, that, that caught up to the river in the summertime. We also had the introduction of Denimo, you know, during that stretch. Did you really? Which was also problematic for a lot of our uh, historic grass beds and areas like Rainbow Run and area, you know, some of those great fishing areas that had the really high, you know, trout per mile numbers, you know, almost bighorn kind of numbers. Uh, you know, a lot of those places got combination Diddy Mo and the work on the dam and everything. They just, you know, the character in them changed and, the, you know, the, they just don't fish like they used to. I, you know, I even went through a month spell late summer this year when I was skipping Rainbow Run on a float, <laughs> you know, which is just unbelievable. You know, I would have never thought I'd ever do that, you know, that the kind of water that's in there, but, um, you, you know, the, it, it's a, you know, tailwaters change, you know, a lot, especially one like this, that's so big and, you know, ha has such a differing flow regimes. And, you know, there's a, you see a lot of change over the years, you know, when part of being successful on the river is just being able to adapt to those changes in the, from year to year and figuring out, you know, how those fish are adapting to it, you know, where you find them this year, you're not necessarily going to find them next season. So you got to be able to change it up a little bit at times. You get big pushes of water during big rain events, that sort of thing changes the bottom a little bit here and there that adds into trying to keep ahead of it. And one of the things that I found was I might find fish somewhere for a year and the next year, they're not there. Two years later, they show back up there for whatever reason, I don't, mm -hmm. you know, being able to draw back on that 15, 20 years experience. You're like, okay, I'm, I remember this. As a matter of fact, I was talking to some friends last night and I said, do you remember when and went through the scenario? And one of them said that was about probably 12, 13 years ago. Number one, how did I even remember that? I can't remember what I had for dinner last night, but I can remember that specific event, which drew me back to start tying the same type of flies that I was tying at that time knowing that there ought to be something going on there. Yeah, Maybe right. I just hadn't hit the right thing. So yeah. that knowledge of all those years comes in handy. And, and circling back around, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it's the ticket. For some years it doesn't work, but boy, when it does, you you feel like, oh, I finally did something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I finally did something right <laughs> that maybe somebody else didn't know. So how far down does the trout water go from the dam? So if I started at Wolf Creek, about how many miles could I fish for trout? Well, it, it definitely probably, I'd say at least 60 miles for sure, down to the Tennessee line, you're going to find trout and probably a little bit into Tennessee. But, you know, once you get so far down, you know, the, their numbers probably become pretty thin and you know, there might be some big fish down there. They probably have to be just to survive. Uh, yeah. down there with those kind of striper populations that they deal with. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I'd say you try, you find trout all the way to Tennessee line about 60 miles. Um, okay. You know, your best trout fishing is probably going to be in the upper half of that, you know, the upper 40 miles or so. There are some pretty, you know, good runs on that real lower stretch, but they're few and far between, it seems like, you know, the shoal areas. And Is that like below Burksville? Yeah, down around Cloyd's Landing and McMillan's Ferry and some of those areas down below Burksville. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Because whenever I pass over that bridge coming out of there, uh -huh. coming out of Burksville, I look to the right and I'm like, man, some of that looks so good. Yeah, there is some good water around Burksville there, <laughs> even all the way down to like the Highway 61 bridge and even down below the 61 bridge, some really good trout water. Uh, the, the river character changes a little bit down there. It becomes a little bit deeper river, a little bit broader. Uh, of course, you're closer to Cordell Hole Lake, you know, which is where yeah. those, you know, big 50, 60 pound stripers migrate from. So, uh, you know, you're going to see more of those kind of fish down there cruising around. And, uh, you know, that's pretty tough on the trout populations at times but uh, you know there there is some good fishing in the areas down on that lower stretch for sure most of what i do is concentrated on the first 30 miles that's where i do most of my drift boat fishing trout would really have to run the gauntlet down low down there below burksville wouldn't they? they some of them do you know there's some there's some good trout down there i mean there's some big ones for sure yeah i've been i've been hearing that but i haven't been sure if they are or they're not and is it worth going down there? And for what I'm doing, it's not worth it for me to go down there and just try to catch one big one. I'd rather just fish under an indicator and shoot the bull with my friends for a day. That's really what that's all about. Well, the Cumberland's a great place to do that, for sure. Yeah, it is. It really is. It's big enough to where you're not on top of each other. You can get away from each other if you have to. Um, so 
everybody that listens to this podcast, Hagen, they know that I like to float. I don't really weigh too much. Prior to owning a drift boat, I did. I weighed it a lot. Uh, I was always looking for access. What I wanted to do is break this next question into a couple different things and talk about waiting versus floating. I waited a little bit, get out of the boat and wait a little bit uh, while I was up there one time uh, and caught, you know, caught some fish and did all that. But I don't, I don't see me doing that. You know, I don't see me going, I want to run up to the Cumberland and wade today, but I do see some of the folks that listen to this podcast, they would do that. And this question comes from the Facebook group, mm -hmm. asked us this one, want to know about wading and, and floating. So I want to break it up into to this next question into two things. So for the wading angler, what information can you give that would help the wading angler? Then for the boating angler, uh, drift boat angler and, and power boat, flat bottom boats, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. What information can you give for them? So let's start with the waiting angler and just kind of talk about the accesses and, you know, the generation and the methods you start with, tips that you can give us, all that sort of stuff to kind of bring us up to speed on waiting. And then we'll move into that, that, uh, that angler that likes to float. You know, I guess I'd probably have to start by saying that, you know, the Cumberland is not a very good wade fishing river. I just keep that in mind. There's just the access to the river is not very good. You know, it is a big, broad river that is pretty deep and has a lot of fluctuation in it. And, and it can be dangerous. I mean, people die in the Cumberland every year, you know, yeah. usually in boats, but, you know, people have drowned from wade fishing here before too. You know, they just get caught out in the water and end up getting a spot where they can't get back to the bank or whatever. And the water is so cold, you can actually get hypothermic, you know, in just a matter of minutes, even in the summertime in the river. So, you know, it can be dangerous wade fishing. You know, a lot of these PFDs and stuff they've got for wade fishing anglers, probably a good idea on a place like the Cumberland for sure. Always a good idea to kind of keep an eye on that water level if you're out there wade fishing. You'll see a lot of guys build like little rock tower structures on the side of the river so they can kind of monitor where that change is um, and, you know, just kind of keep an eye on, you know, so, sometimes you get out there and you're wade fishing, you really get, you know, you're really concentrating on tying a, a different fly on or you're concentrating on working on a fish or whatever. And, you know, that water change can kind of sneak up on you. So you just got to keep that always in the back of your mind that, you know, that water is coming. And, you know, yeah. you really need to stay ahead of it. There are um, a few limited places where uh, if you have long stretches of minimum flows where the generators are shut completely off, you know, you probably need 10 to 12 hours of that consecutive overnight before you're going to have very good wade fishing the next day. Right. Honestly, we haven't seen that in a few years, you know, outside of a freak deal where they're working on a generator or doing something where they've got to turn them off. We've had several high water years here on the Cumberland, which has really kind of further, you know, reduced wade fishing opportunities. There are a couple of public accesses where you can get into the river and wade fish. Uh, one of them would be at uh, the end of Rayman Road up near the campground. And there is a gravel bar there that offers some wade fishing access and the river does get low there. So you can get around pretty good. Now, some people will drive their pickup trucks out on that gravel bar and just fish off their tailgates. So if it's a weekend, you know, you may, you know, have to deal with a little bit of that. They're usually out pretty early, you know, because that water is going to come up pretty early there, but yep. they will be there at first light. And then, of course, you've got Helms Landing Boat Ramp, which uh, it has a pretty long gravel bar on it. And if you have those long stretch minimum flows where the generators are off, you can do some wade fishing there at Helms Landing too. Um, outside of that, most of your wade fishing, well, there is a walk-in access that the Fish and Wildlife own down on Snow Island, just above Rock House. And it's on, it's actually on the south side of the river. So it's pretty difficult to get to driving and you have to cross over a back channel to get out on a snow island. So it's a little bit tricky spot and an easy place to get caught by the water if you're not careful, but you can access Snow Island and do some wade fishing there if you have uh, good water schedules. Outside of that, most of your wade fishing is, is going to be accessed via boat. You know, you'll have to have some kind of watercraft you know, boat, canoe, something to get you to one of those shoal areas or gravel bars where you'll be able to get out and do some wade fishing. You know, one, once you get out there in one of those areas, you know, it's it's pretty typical fishing. You're still looking for long drifts. Um, the, it is a big river, so it's a good idea to kind of just, you know, pick a little piece of it that you're fishing and just focus on that. 
Don't worry so much about, you know, everything that's around you because it can be a little bit intimidating. If you just get in a spot and focus on what's between you and the, you know, the bank slot that you're fishing or whatever, and almost fish it like a, a smaller stream or something, you'll probably be fine. Eat that elephant in little bites. Yeah. Sometimes whenever I would fish on the Cumberland on some of those big shoals or whatever, I was pretty active and I saw a lot of other guys fishing this way too. It's not like I was the only one doing this. In order to get like really long extended drifts, I would cast out a pretty good ways and then I would literally just walk down river with my flies. And sometimes I would, you know, walk a hundred yards down river just to kind of keep that drift going. And then I'd kind of reel it up, walk over into the shallower water and walk way back up and repeat the process and just trying to cover a lot of that water. Almost like you would, you know, coming through in a drift boat, trying to get those, you know, those really long, solid drifts, you know, just to try to cover a lot of water. You can wade fish the Cumberland just like that, too. Just make sure you're covering a lot of water. I did that on the, one of the gravel bars on the lower part of the river. Yeah. Like fish the whole thing and just cast out, walk down, just kept mending until I got to the end and walked back up. It's a lot of walking back and forth, that kind of thing. It might you wear a lot of guys out, but it's real effective, you know. Yeah. You know, as long as you're catching fish, you tend not to worry about all the other stuff, you know, so <laughs> well, that makes the whole day. So what yeah. about, what about the boating angler? How about them? What, what do you think about? I know that you fit, you're like me, you fish from a drift boat. Yeah. The one thing I've noticed up there where there's a lot of distance between ramps. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. There, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't have a whole lot. We don't have a lot, a whole lot of public access on the river. And so that, that really limits your uh, options. You could say you've got a public ramp at the dam and then you've got one in Helms landing about five miles below. Your next one's going to be Winfrey's Ferry, which is at mile 17. And then your next one below that's going to be down at Burksville, which is mile 35 or so. So those are pretty spread out because of the nature of the river. It's just not feasible to do a drift boat float, just drifting with no motor. You're probably not going to be able to cover 18 miles in a day. You probably don't want to do 12 miles. So, you know, that does kind of limit the access a little bit. Now, if you have like, you can't access the river at Rock House, which is, you know, halfway between Helms and Winfrey's. And a lot of guys will do that. You can't do it with a boat, but you can do it with a kayak or a canoe or something like that. And a lot of guys will do that. You know, they'll, that, that makes for a pretty good float. You know, either going Rock House to Winfrey's or you could go, you know, Helms to Rock House doing something like that. Or even the dam to Rock House, maybe. You know, there is pretty limited access. You know, of course, I've been on the river, you know, my whole life. And I know a lot of folks in that, you know, I've got enough private accesses lined up to where I have different drift boat options that I can do on that upper stretch. But it is kind of limiting. And for most people that don't have a motorized boat, um, if you have a motorized boat, then you can pretty well get around the river uh, wherever you want to go. And it's a pretty good way to go. You have to know the river pretty well because of the fluctuation and the river level fluctuations. It, it can be kind of dangerous. The early morning fog can be very hazardous for boaters. You know, it, it can literally be so thick at times in the summer that it's almost difficult to tell up from down. You know, if you don't know the river and you're trying to run a boat full steam in that, I mean, that, that can be dangerous. There's going to be people out there, you know, in canoes and drift boats, and, and you're going to be right on, on top of them before you know. And so, you know, I encourage people who don't know the river, you know, you probably just need to take your time, you know, especially in those kind of early morning fog conditions. Just don't be in a hurry. There's plenty of fish everywhere. You know, this isn't tournament fishing. You don't have to race anywhere onto the river. You can basically start anywhere and start drifting and run into trout. So I just be cautious, you know, whenever you're out there and, and be courteous to those other anglers, you know, that they're out there trying to do their thing. You know, there's one thing I know, two things that, that we've talked about so far. One, I've got a picture of a friend of mine with a flashlight on the front of the boat is about, about 515 or so. Just looking at the bottom going, yeah, it still looks, you know, pretty deep here. And you can feel with the ore tips, you know, whenever it starts getting real low. Uh -huh, yeah. uh, but I was, I just told him, I said, I just don't want to hit anybody or a stump or a rock or anything like that that was one thing and then you were talking a while ago just to, about how cold it gets how cold the water is mm -hmm. and we were up there in july close to the end of july i believe about 8 30 in the morning we were dressed for summer right and in the campground it was summertime at, at 
at 4.30 when we mm-hmm. got got outside and started hooking the boat up. About 8.30, I was getting out hand warmers because it was so it was so cold and damp and oh, foggy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And oh, it was, I was like, what are we doing out here? I could be sleeping in, but we caught some fish. So that, you know how that is, that clears things up pretty quick. Oh yeah, we're getting out. Yeah, but those two things really, when you, when you went through those, the first, the, the fog, I said, yep, experience that. You, you see me shaking my head and mm-hmm. then, the second one was how cold it was. And yes, it yeah. gets, that water is pretty dang cold. Yeah, we rarely, rarely see good above about 60 or so. You know, sometimes it'll creep up in the low 60s and the low water in the summertime. But, you know, even this summer, I checked it once this August and Rainbow Run, I think it was 56 degrees. So it stays cold. It makes it foggy in the morning. So can, it can be dangerous. Yeah. yeah. It can be tough sled. And, you know, when it, there are areas in the river when, uh, and again, you know, we haven't seen this in the last few years, just the kind of flow regimes that we've had. But when you get those really long stretches of minimum flow, you know, those, some of those, you know, boat guys have got to be kind of careful. It gets hard to get around in places, up and down some of those shoals. You will see a lot of guys running jets on the river. That was my next question right there is what, what do you think's jet or prop? So jets. Yeah, the fish and wildlife guys run jets up and down the river. Oh, do they? Yeah. Of course, you know, jet motors, you know, they have their own drawbacks. Yeah. They suck in leaves and we we get a lot of leaves in the fall on the Cumberland. There's trees all in those hills. And yeah. Coming down out of those hills on in those streams and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And the leaves start the leaves start falling in mid-September and they're still coming. You know, we had them on the river today. You know, we have two months of, of pretty good leaves out there and that, that's tough on the those jet motors, you know, they suck them all up. So it, it, it is easier to give around, get around that low water the jet motors. I, I personally love those kind of days whenever some of those real low water weekend days when the motor boat guys can't get around. <laughs> and, you know, it kind of leaves all that territory to drift boat guys, and guys in kayaks or whatever, you know, kind of limits, you know, who's in there. And I was talking about the the bottom that morning, that, that foggy morning. But a couple of things that I noticed when, when we've been up there is one thing is it's big, like you were talking about earlier. And the further you go down, the bigger it seems to get in the more areas. I think we would go back to how do you eat that elephant one bite at a time and just section off and find you a spot and get in there. But it's cold. Another thing I noticed is it's a lot like the rivers here. It, you'll run up on a shoal or grab a bar. Let's say a shoal would go uh, across the river. So that shoal, it would go shoal then start dropping off into a hole and then come up on another shoal. And once in a while you'll have a run that either goes left or right. Uh, when the water gets low enough. So there's a lot of different different types of water there. Mm-hmm. And I can see the fly selection being pretty diverse too, like kind of like we talked about also. So with the with the fly types and the, the water variation, that those type different types of water, when you're reading the water, and we talked about this a little bit last uh, the other day when we were just shooting the bull, but, uh, and we do a lot of things very similarly on the tailwaters up there and the tailwaters down here. But when you're reading the water, what are some of the things that you look for when you're putting putting anglers on fish? It's uh, it's a little bit tricky on the Cumberland. I mean, I, I tell people the Cumberland, it's like guiding on 10 different rivers in a way. <laughs> and sometimes you'll be on three or four of those in the same day, depending on where the water level is at the time. And, you know, primarily, you know, what I'm looking for on the Cumberland is number one, where's the water level? Because essentially what happens is the water drops, the fish will move towards the middle of the river. They'll move into the center slots. And as the water rises, the fish will get up onto the edges more. You know, one, you have to sort of know, okay, was the river low or high in relative terms today? And that's going to tell you a lot about where the fish are. So that's a big thing. More than anything, I probably look at depth change. It seems that the trout really like, they love depth change on this river. You know, that those spots where you were talking about where you've got shoal and then it goes into a little deeper slot or whatever, you know, that's where you found those fish, you know, wherever that depth change is. And sometimes it's going to be 10 feet off the bank. Sometimes it's going to be in the middle of the river. Um, It just kind of depends on where the flow is at the time and what the contours of the river look like down there, essentially, you know, And, and that can change from spot to spot depending on where you are. Depth change is obviously a big thing. Anytime you see some kind of a submerged rock or any kind of structure that has flow on it, you know, is great big trout water on the Cumberland. 
most guys that fish, you know, they look at some of that stuff and, they, and it looks fishy. I mean, you just see it and it looks fishy. It's a big giant boulder underwater that has good current flow next to it. I mean, it's it's everything that you think about, you know, whenever you think big fish water, you know, and and that kind of that's kind of stuff on the cover and hold them. So, you know, I obviously look for that kind of stuff, you know, flow on structure, depth changes. And the other big thing would be seams. And, you know, most guys that fish know what I'm talking about, but it, it's basically just a, a change in the current speed. And usually on the Cumberland, it's going to be indicated by an eddy. So you're going to have an eddy on the bank somewhere, and it's going to have a seam of current next to it. And that's where those fish are going to be. They're going to be sitting in that seam. Sometimes they'll be sitting in the eddy, but they'll come into the seam if they see something they want to eat. That's where your flies need to be, is in those edge seams a lot of times. Particularly as the water gets higher, you know, you start fishing the edges, you know, you start fishing those edge seams that's where you're going to find fish i'm going to stop you right there and say this hagan if you're listening out there all the stuff that he just talked about we experienced as soon as the water came on just like you just said we moved to the edges and we found that water running by rocks we found the water running by a lot of wood there's a lot of wood mm-hmm. up there next to the banks and those fish immediately moved into it like i was stunned at how fast they got in that water like the water hit and five minutes later, we're fishing the side and the fish are there and they're still eating just like they were out in the middle. So I don't want, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I want to make sure that everybody knows that all this stuff that you're saying, I'm just sitting here shaking my head because we see a lot of that here too, but I experienced it up there. So I know that this is good information. So just want to make sure that our listeners out there know that the folks that invest in the podcast, they know that this is, this is worth hearing. You know, the other thing that I look for a lot, obviously, you know, whenever you're out there is, you know, I look for rise of fish, you know, I mean, they, they, a lot of times they'll give themselves away to you. Even if you're, even if you're not fishing dry flies, uh, you know, just seeing rising fish is going to be indicative of where they are. It's good to make little mental notes of where you see those fish because, you know, that, that'll come in handy at times whenever you're not seeing them rise. You know, maybe right. you'll, you'll kind of remember the type of water that you saw them rise in. They're probably still in there, you know, just not feeding on the surface. So, yeah, I always like to pay attention to where those risers are. It doesn't have to be for that day. It can be for two days later, you'll still yeah. back in there and I'll be there. And there they are. They're still there. Yep. All good information right there for sure. Uh, I didn't hear anything in there that I wasn't just like shaking my head. Yes. Because we've experienced it up there. So that's, that's all good information right there. I, I appreciate you doing that Yeah, and not, not holding back. I like that. Yeah. A lot, a lot of times, um, you know, people ask me, you know, out on the river, you know, what are you getting them on or whatever? And, I heard another guy say this one time. There's a lot of truth to it, especially on the Cumberland. You know, my typical response is a good drift, you know, because, yep. you know, that, that's that's probably a lot more important most days than, you know, the particular fly that you've selected or whatever. And that kind of goes back to us talking about how you can Frankenstein fish this river or whatever. If, yeah. if you've got a good drift where the fish are, you're probably going to find one down there that's, you know, going to lick on it or take an interest in it or something you know so you know that's just a big thing about you know fishing a big intimidating looking river that looks kind of nondescript particularly this time of year whenever you don't have great visibility down the water column and everything right you know a lot of a lot of the river looks kind of nondescript but there's really a lot of stuff going on down there you know there there is a lot of contour in the river bottom and that sort of thing you know it's good if if you're fortunate enough to be out there on one of those extremely low water days when they've got long minimum flows, it can be really valuable to use that as an opportunity to sort of get a mental image of what that river bottom looks like. So that whenever you come back and it's got a generator, a flow on it, you know where the shelves are and you know where those depth changes are, you know where the main channel in the river is, and you kind of know how everything lays out. So you don't necessarily have to see the contours to know where you need to be fishing. And, and that that can be really important at times, uh, particularly in the fall of the year, whenever they start running sluice water and one thing or another, and, and you start losing some visibility in the river. So your sluice, your sluice is dirty brown looking water too. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a tea color. Yeah. I don't know that I've ever really understood exactly why that water isn't 
clear but yeah i don't know either it's far enough down where you think okay it should be clear water in the lake coming through there and i understand that it's coming through the the sluice gate and all that but the the generation water is coming through the generators too so i'm sure there's something out there that's there i'm sure there's a reason you know they did that project down there center hill on the generators mm-hmm. and i guess they had a lot of success with that so it's my understanding they don't run a sluice anymore down there is that correct yeah they're still running it some i'm sorry oh, it's, it's, it's been on on and off yeah oh, okay well, they're supposed to do that same thing on the cumberland i think yeah they're supposed to do that same repair and that, they told me that they didn't think they'd have to run the sluice anymore on the cumberland after they did this repair which would be awesome That'd be good yeah yeah but it, it would take it, it'll take several years to do that you know, one of the things that, that you were talking about there was was fishing those Frankenstein flies. And, you know, in the evenings after people get home from work, they'll tie flies or they'll go out in the yard and cast mm-hmm. or they'll, you know, clean a fly line. We'll do all those things. But the one thing that you can't practice until you get to the water is presentation. That's the one thing that you have almost have to be on the water to practice that. You know, you, you invested all this time in these flies and invested all this time in buying the materials and reading online, reading magazines, talking to your buddies, you can't wait to get out there and try those different flies. And sometimes I think presentation gets kicked to the, you know, kicked to the back seat because you've put all this energy in these flies and in these new rods and these reels and these lines and bags and nets and you name it. And we were, you know, we're, yeah. we're buying it new nippers or whatever, but you say they still can't, you still don't know how to fish though. You just got to get out there and do it. Yeah, there's no substitute. Yeah, you got to you yeah. got to learn to fish. Yeah, it takes a lot of time. You know, it takes experience. It's like golf, kind of in yeah. a way. You know, I mean, you're not just going to go out there. It's, I tell people all the time, this is not a school from which you will graduate. I agree with that. I mean, this is a lifelong learning. I mean, it's constant. You know, so yeah. So as you were talking about that, I was thinking that yeah, I can I can get out there and cast, and I do every spring. I'll get out and cast. You know, especially if we don't musky fish. Or something I'll, and I get a little lazy. I think, okay, I need to, I need to start tuning up a little bit and, you know, hitting some different yeah, yeah. things and get a long cast out there and go in the garage, grab a rod every once in a while and just walk out and cast a few. But yeah, can't do anything about your presentation out in the, out in the grass. Just can't. Yeah. So yeah. And it's, it's obviously important, you know, I know the people that fish with me are like, man, I wish sometimes he just shut up, you know, but it, just trying to get it just right. Cause uh, there isn't anybody on the river that wants me to catch it want you to catch a fish worse than me. So I want to make sure that I'm doing, trying to do everything I can and help you have a good day. I would, I would rather somebody get on, learn some things that they can at least go back and feel a little bit more confident, you know, get a little bit better every time. That's what my hope is. Yeah, for sure. Another thing I wanted to talk about was, and this was, this was one of the podcast group. One of those folks had talked about the a new bridge. And when we were coming back one time from Jamestown after eating a cheeseburger, of course, my life apparently revolves around food, but we were coming back from Jamestown and the road, if I remember right, it was a, a two lane, maybe a four lane that changed into a two lane. But there was another road that kind of went off to the right, kind of at an angle, like they were going to change that roadway from going across the dam, leave Jamestown, headed for the dam. That road went off to the right, if I can remember correctly. Looked like it may it may have been a four lane split four lane something like that, but it it headed just straight off to the river. And I don't we were kind of wondering what that was when we were there. And then I saw that question as well uh, on the on the podcast group. So can you talk about that just for a minute? I don't remember what what road we were even on or what that road number is. Uh, you know, of course they they did all this work on the dam and of course the highway 127 actually goes right over top of the dam. So uh, I think the traffic they were concerned about, you know, future wear and tear on the dam and uh, you know it is kind of a security risk too maybe. So they've decided to uh basically reroute highway 127 and they're and they're going to bridge the river at Blackfish Creek, which is about 3 miles below the dam. And so they're going to build a bridge across the Cumberland River and that's going be the new highway 127 and they're basically taking that traffic off of the dam so i don't exactly know when that bridge construction is going to take place probably here in the next couple of years i'm not exactly sure what kind of impact that's going to have on the fishing short term you know long term it's not going to make much impact i don't believe you know short term depending on you know if they've got equipment in the river channel and it could mark things up a little bit at least in areas of the river so you know we'll 
we'll see how that construction comes along. We'll cross that bridge when we get there, <laughs> as they say. You know, I can, the first thing that came to my mind was you might get some more low water times there too, as they're working. So it could switch that yeah, schedule right. up just yeah. a little bit from mm-hmm. what you maybe what you're used to. So maybe those weekend low water days may turn into a mm-hmm. Tuesday, Wednesday, low water day instead of a Saturday, Sunday, low water day. Yeah, so that'd right. be interesting to watch too. And you don't know when they're going to start it. You said, I do not know. I, I don't think that they're on a uh, schedule. I think that they're behind schedule. So I, I don't, I think that they were supposed to have already started the bridge, but they're not there yet. They've got a lot of the base work up to the river done, but they haven't started the bridge yet. So I suspect in the next couple of years, We'll start seeing that. That was interesting. That was a really nice looking road that went off that way. And we we all commented on it. And I think somebody said, that looks like it leads right down to the river. I thought ah, they won't build a bridge, but, but good if they do. Kentucky has nice roads. Yeah, they do. I, get, I get a lot of comments from people <laughs> about, you know, how nice Kentucky's yeah, roads are. Those roads are. up in there are the bomb, dude. So, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Four lanes when you wouldn't think there would be one. They're all pretty smooth compared to some of the roads I travel on for sure. Yeah. So... For the last question, I always like to give the guests just just give you the floor uh, and let you just talk about something that you think will help our listeners. What question haven't we asked that you think would be helpful for the angler to be successful fishing the Cumberland River? Well, I, you know, we we touched a, a little bit on it, David, but maybe you know, maybe not quite enough. And I, I know that's that's always a big issue for people. You know, whenever they're talking, whenever you're talking about a destination or a place to go fish or whatever, you know, the the kind of flies that you use when you're there, you know, is always at the top of the list of people's questions. A lot of times, you know, we don't have a fly shop in this area. You'd have to go to Lexington or you know one of the bigger cities around to find any, uh, you know, anything like that. But it, it doesn't really matter a whole lot like we were talking about you know the probably the most important thing on this river for most types of fishing that you do if you're nymphing or fishing dry flies you know i'm not really talking about streamer fishing or wet fly fishing but if you're nymphing or fishing dry flies or a combination of both a lot of times we fish like dry fly dropper stuff the most important thing to remember is you know your drift is the critical factor you know you, you can take just about any fly and if you get the right drift where the fish are, then it's probably going to catch trout. And so, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about, you know, panicking over fly selection. If you've got just any kind of standard old bead head, whatever you're used to fishing anywhere, you know, this is probably, you know, the kind of place it's going to work. That's uh, one thing you can probably scratch off your worry list is, you know, for the most part, it's going to be your fly selection. It's going to be a lot more critical about where you're finding your fish. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about how we go about finding those fish, and it's not really rocket science. Most of the guys who are listening to this podcast probably, you know, they've got some experience fishing. They've probably done it before, and they've got a little bit of feel for reading water. And it's a big, broad river, but if you can just break it into little pieces, and, you know, just focus on the little piece that you're fishing at the time, then, uh, you know, I think, I think you'll like the river. I mean, it's, it's a really, it's a great trout fishery and, and a very unique spot. Um, just not the kind of place that uh, you think you'd come across in Kentucky for sure. So where would one, one, one follow-up question to all of that? I, again, shaking my head. Yep. 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 So we're, we're in tune. We could probably get in a boat together and have a really good day, but we, we yeah, probably wouldn't we get much fishing sometime. and we probably do more talking, but, uh, so <laughs> there's the, there's the, for places to eat, there's Jamestown and whatever the name of that little diner is on the square there, two doors down mm-hmm. from the guitar shop. If you're in there and you can find that guitar shop, just, uh, facing the door, look to the right down the square a little bit. And there's a diner there. And then down in Burksville, there's a place that has, uh, it's a, it's a little like an old timey drive-in where they slide the window open and ask you what you want. And you tell them, you know, mm-hmm. I want a cheeseburger. And then you go back for a milkshake, but their, their milkshakes are, they are good. Uh, where's a good place to stay up there? We camp, but is there a Good place to stay. I, I passed a couple of motels that looked pretty good, uh, but I couldn't even tell you where I was at the time. The river's changed a lot in that regard since I first started fishing here. 
this used to be like extremely remote and there was really nowhere to stay mm-hmm. down here. I mean, there was nothing down here. You know, we've got some pretty good options down here now. Everything from some, you know, some great Airbnb stuff up in the Jamestown area. There's some really neat little hotels just kind of locally owned. There's a place called the Anchor Inn up in Jamestown. That's a really neat little hotel. Uh, it has a liquor store right next door to it. Can be there. <laughs> The state, the state park, Lake Cumberland State Park up there outside of Jamestown is a pretty neat place to stay. It has a great big lodge. And when I say lodge, it's more like a state park hotel. You know, don't get too carried away, but it's called Lure Lodge. You know, they have a marina there and they have rental cabins and disc golf and a number of things, you know, and a, and a restaurant there. So that, that's a pretty good option for people to stay. Down on the river itself, we've got a number of different cabin rental options down there. A couple of different private owners that we have. And then there's a new place that we're working, that I'm working with quite a bit now called Trout House. And it is down in the Creelsboro community on the river. It's about nine miles below the dam. Trout House has its own private ramp. So if you rent there, then you also get access to the ramp and it's at a great location. So uh, that, that's really good for you know guys that are floating or whatever that's uh the perfect halfway spot between the dam and Winfrey's ferry so that gives you some great drift boat options there you know if you're staying at trout house and a, a really good boat ramp and just a great place i mean it, it's you know geared towards fly fishermen and it's all brand new they just bought it last winter and, and remodeled everything and in the process of putting an entertainment barn into it and everything. Oh. So it, it really first class oh, nice. place, um, trout house. Uh, you can go on my website too. And I've got several different of these places listed on there and contact information and all that. So like I said, we stayed in the, in the part below state park below the dam. I think it was a state park and it was really, it yeah. really is. I can't say enough about the experience we had up there. It was really nice compared to some of the other places. I've, other campgrounds I've stayed in where people are fighting and fussing. And- yeah. That, that's a, uh, that's Kindle recreation area there. It's just a neat place. You know, it's a really nice campground and well, run and maintained and everything so. yeah it really is and, and a lot of people from here run up and fish some some people run up and fish hatchery creek for a day and come back to to the nashville area and, and yeah yeah uh, probably you know many many other areas too but i'm surprised at how little i'm surprised at how little i do that yeah really yeah I thought when they were building that creek, I was like, well, I'll be over there every day. You know, and I, I just hardly ever go over there and fish. I got a friend that lives on the canyon. I mean, he's right on the river. And I don't know how many years it's been since he's fished. At first, he was down there every day. Yeah, is that know, right? But then he was like, eh, you know, <laughs> I don't have to go out there. And next thing you know, yeah. When's the last time you fished? Uh, can't he, he can't even remember. And I think, wow. But, yeah. you know, life has got other stuff going on. But uh, I just prefer that river, too. You know, if I'm going to take a day to go fish, usually I'm just going to get the boat out and go float the river, you know. So, Hagen, I believe that was uh, helpful for both the experienced fly angler that, that maybe wants to make a run up there. And then definitely the new newer fly anglers and the intermediate folks, I think, will get quite a bit out of it as well. Feels like we hit three different levels there all in the conversation so so let's close this thing out if you find value in the podcast share this episode and podcast with your friends drop by the southeastern fly store explore the merch that fuels the southeastern fly podcast remember we've got the coaching sessions and there are sometimes available and the benefits of that can be found at the store as well so we just uh talked with a, a guide that has 20 years guiding experience on the cumberland the guys from a Stu williams wooden drift boat you can be found at www.cumberlandtroutfitters.net. Hagen, man, I really appreciate you stopping by with us and joining us for this show. I think it was really good information. Like I know I stopped you right in the middle of it and said that, that you were giving up good information and true information. I think all of our guests are that way. I was up there not too long ago, and that's why I was just shaking my head. Yeah, this is this is all good information here. So very much appreciated. Yeah, yeah. thank you, David. Well, you just listened to Hagen Wan on the Southeastern Fly Podcast. See you next time.
Well, I know you have had a long day. I've had a long day too. So I think uh, we do need to get together and fish though. Absolutely. Yeah. Come up sometime. We'll fish. 